Welcome everyone here and everyone on Zoom. It's so good to see you all. Uh, we have a good program tonight, but before that, we have a little bit of business to transact. If you haven't signed in over there when you first come in the door, please sign that. The rec department needs an account of everyone who's here. Do that if you haven't done that. Janet, would you like to do some hospitality? Oh, sure. Thanks so much, Mike. I'm ready. That's it. Oh, I got in for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> People on Zoom. They don't need to see me. Yes, they do. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hello. <laughs> We've got refreshments here tonight. Sorry, people on Zoom, you're missing it. Um, oh, you're drinking wine. Come and bring us some. Um, thanks to the Blakes, please. Lynn Baker brought wonderful drinks and ice, and we've got delicious cookies from Ann and Richard Pocat. And Bill Garcia brought cake. You know, what could be better? And I'm gonna pass this out, distribute this for people to sign up for next month on December 1st. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Lots of shows coming up. On Sunday in an email and you can also get them on the website and you need to sign up with the leader of the trip. And if you can't, if you sign up and you can't make the trip, please let the leader go because there's often a wait list because these uh, bird walks and field trips we run are very popular. And let's, what other business do we need to take care of? I guess we need our speaker introduced, Judy Walker. No, I'm not the speaker. She Walker is not the speaker. I am not the speaker. Hi. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine. He was the past president of Audubon, uh, Ken Neidel. Uh, he was a uh, teacher, a science teacher at Latin or Charlotte? At Latin. Charlotte, uh, Latin. And um, he has been doing all kinds. Of, he also ran our uh, Charlotte Christmas bird count for a number of probably 10 to 15 years. Uh, that's now being passed on to uh, a youngin, uh, Matthew Withrow. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, unless you want it. No, that's Ron. He's Ron's <laughs> over there. Um, and he uh, has, has been also uh, recently doing a lot of, um, or should, let's back up a little bit. He's a meticulous how do I want to say that number number cruncher, although he likes to do that too, but he really keeps, he's a true scientist in that he keeps track of everything. Uh, so he knows when the when first bird, when the bird first comes to his yard, when it leaves, et cetera, et cetera. So he's got all that down. And now what he's taken on uh, in his public retirement is he is the uh, coordinator for the, what's called the climate Oh, great. Now I've forgotten what it is. <laughs> Climate Watch Project. <laughs> um, and what happens is uh, it's sort of like the, uh, uh, the Atlas, which you've probably heard some about, um, but it's, it's a little bit different in that it's focusing just on specific birds. So he's going to give us a little bit. It's been going on for a number of years already, and it's supposed to go on forever, kind of like the Christmas bird counts forever. Um, and uh, to get an idea, well, he'll tell you exactly what it's about. So this is Ken Nidal. I really want, to, want you to give him a good hand. Okay, all right. I promised many awkward moments. This is very strange. <laughs> she said I was a teacher and I would be all over the place teaching. So I got a plant with feet right here. Looking back. What? If you look back that way. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Boot that up. We're going to try my forward and backward button, right? Hey. Okay. All right. Got it. I'm rolling. There will come a point when I want. 
uh, point when I want to point to things, but we'll figure that out when we get there. Okay. Um, I volunteered to give this talk. Why did I do that? Um, we're a bird club and we do things. Some of the things we do, Christmas bird camps, we do field trips and all these other uh, adventures. Uh, we have been doing Climate Watch since 2017. And I thought that many of you just didn't know what that was because it goes on behind the scenes. It's largely me emailing people and training people and we go out on our own back and forth. But you know, it is something that belongs to Mecklenburg Audubon. So um, uh, I feel like you should be aware of it. Also, there is an opportunity for participation too. So if you're interested, you might wanna uh, join us in our uh, venture. So that's why I'm here. Um, I felt like not so much like a presentation, but more like a report to the club. Just, as, just like a report. I don't know if that means anything to you, but it kind of does to me. Uh, that means it may not be as exciting as if I was. <laughs> Maybe it will. I'll try to do so. Okay, here we go. I thought I would begin chronologically. So I'm starting with the first climate report, which was done in uh, 2014. When this came out, it was big news nationwide because 314 species were pre predicted to be on the brink of uh, extinction because of climate change. That included uh, two species of special concern in uh, North Carolina. Okay. Now you all hear about survival by degrees, the climate report. That's not this one. That came later, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Prior to that, though, I'm going back to this slide. Back when I was teaching and doing presentations elsewhere, I often used this. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a um, uh, map of the United States. Uh, I'll try to point. There's like Alaska. <laughs> and there's the West Coast. And there's Florida. And there's up there. Maine. There's Kansas. No. <laughs> Testing my geography skills. Um, and uh, this came from Christmas bird count data, actually. And this is the average winter location of these birds. One dot is in the 1960s, and the other one is 2005, 2006, to show them shifting north. And up here, they're correlating that with a rise in temperature. Got it? So marbled, marbled merlet, merlet, I looked it up before I came, merlet, uh, moving. <laughs> you can't see the map. But that, that's kind of like Washington State up here and uh, Alaska's up there. Um, you might be interested in, let's see. Boiled chickadee moving all the way across the uh, continent, the average location. But the general trend is up. You can't see the uh, 1960s dots. They're at the beginning of the lines. And then the blue dots are in the 2005s and 2006s. So you see these species are uh, shifting the ranges north. So this was known in the 2014 uh, report came out. And then the 2019 improved version of the Audubon Climate Report Survival by Degrees. We had uh, Curtis Smalling come and talk about the uh, climate report. I guess it was pre-COVID. So it must have been like three or four uh, uh, years ago. And I feel like I asked him a question. And I need you to back me up uh, for people that were here. I think one of the improvements to the report is they took into account things like uh, habitat loss. Is that, do you remember yes, it that way? I remember him telling a story and I'm making this up, like imagine like a bird in uh, North Carolina shifting north and the optimal habitat is gonna be east end of Long Island. Not taking into account that that's where New York City is. Yes, so they were predicting them going places, but in the first version, didn't take into account what the habitat would be like when they got there. Got that? Yeah, yeah so that's uh, another important concern. And I think it had a lot to do with the improvement in the second version. And you see it's gone from 314 species on the brink to uh, 389 species on the brink. Um, 
I'm reluctant to do a deep dive into this, but these are the vulnerable birds for North Carolina with a three degree centigrade warming scenario. 28 species with high vulnerability, 35 moderate, 32 with low vulnerability and 80 with uh, that are stable. And I wanted to read those birds to you a little bit and see if you can, uh, one thing I never did with when I was teaching, I never asked questions because I was so hurried to get to the content because I, <laughs> whatever, that's a long story. But I'll ask you a question and see if you notice what I noticed. Maybe you won't, which is okay because you can notice everything. But uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to go over there to read. Eastern Whipper Will, uh, Red Headed Woodpecker, Blue Headed Vireo, Fish Crow, Brown Headed Nut Hatch, Winter Rain, Hermit Thrush, Wood Thrush, Brown. Thrasher, Red Cross Bill, Field, Field Sparrow, Dark Eyed Junko, Hens, Lotus Sparrow, Eastern Toady, keep going, Judy. Uh, 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 Boattail Crackle. Boattail Crackle, Warm Mating Warbler, Golden Wing Warbler, Morning Warbler, Cerulean Warbler, Magnolia Warbler, Black Burning Warbler, Chest Excited, Black Coated Blue, um, Fine. Fine, Fine Warbler, Yellow Coated Warbler, Black. Yep, green. I don't know if I'm going through that too quick, but um, Canada and Canada. Canada. Yeah. 14 of those 28 birds are um, high mountain residents, which makes perfect sense. Climate's warming, and you, they're only found in the mountains in the summer. This is a summer breeding range, like cerulean warbler, black throated blue, black throated green, black burnian. You know, if you're wondering where are those, <laughs> this is their, their, their summer location because we consider those here in Charlotte just to be migrants. They do winter in our mountains. So obviously they would be some of the first birds that would be threatened. If the climate warms and you go up and you're on a mountain, you get pinched off the top. Now, globally, that's a huge problem for birds. Wherever there are mountains, the birds, many of the birds that are most threatened are the ones that are uh, uh, high mountain residents because there's just nowhere to go uh, if you're pushed up. Got to ask about morning warbler. I look, I check range maps. Why is that on the list? For North Carolina. For North Carolina? Um, it doesn't breed. Yeah. It doesn't I, breed somewhere I was hoping now. Martina was here. Uh, hmm? West Virginia, uh, yeah, so I guess they're threatened. <laughs> they're not here, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know why morning oh, warbler. I, I know why. This is also has to do with the birds going through here. They're not all breeders here. They, they, they at some point in time spend some time here in North Carolina. Okay. Um, that's that. If I remember correctly, that's you might want to repeat that for the people on the website. Uh, Judy's saying that it's her impression that these birds may not be just residents, but just passing through the state. I was interpreting. Resident birds, and that would mean why uh, 14 of the 28 birds that are uh, in worse shape are uh, found only in Western North Carolina. In addition to the warblers, that would be uh, blue-headed vireo, winter wren, red crossbill, uh, hermit thrush, and dark-eyed junco. So all those birds are summer residents on mountain tops. Anyway, that's uh, we're we're kind of getting off the main track here, but. Uh, but that was uh, a little bit interesting. There's some on there that are really surprising to me, like red-headed woodpecker, brown thrasher, eastern toady, um, uh, pine warbler. So, um, what? Yeah. That's what I was going to get to in an explanation in a second. Uh, um, this is a two degree warming scenario. So you often hear, do what you can to uh, help limit our warming to uh, two degrees centigrade rather than higher. And things are much better. But most of the mountain birds I listed are not on here anymore. It's black coated and green. But all those other ones are uh, safe. We can keep warming to two degrees. Um, but did, I, did you do that? <laughs> the wrong direction. 
you're going forward. Um, I'll tell you why I circled brown headed nut hatch in a minute, but um, Eastern Toe, he jumped out at me like, gosh, why are they threatened? And I, I did a little bit of looking up and Tohi's like uh, scrubby habitat, um, farmland that's being abandoned and becoming more brushy. That's great for uh, Tohi's. So they're talking more about forested area increasing in North Carolina and development. Uh, housing developments and that kind of thing. So Tohees might be more threatened by habitat loss and climate change. And maybe that explains brown thrasher as well. Uh, I don't know what's going on with uh, redheaded woodpeckers. Uh, people don't keep snags up anymore. Um, I had a tree cut my, down in my backyard. We kept it. We call it spike now. I put a face on it and everything. <laughs> But whatever. <laughs> but uh, I guess maybe that might be development as well. Wetlands being drained and you know tree snags not being available. So this might be more habitat than climate because climate is more under control here at two degrees rather than uh, three degrees. Okay, trying to go forward. Okay, surprise. Um, now's where we start the violin music, it's loading, I pull out my scientist hat. Um, I'm under the impression that a lot of people do reports, put out the report, and then they're done. But Audubon has decided to test their predictions. So that really tugged at my heartstrings, being a scientist. Uh, one thing about science, like many, Ventures is scientists are open to falsifiability, be proven wrong. So, uh, in seeking truth, they did the next step, and I'm tears coming down my eyes right now. Can you see that on the Zoom? They decided not to just publish the report, but to test their report and test their predictions and see if the birds are responding the way that their models uh, predict. I uh, made a bumper sticker. I keep this on my car. I'm not selling these. I'm just saying this is just science is equal to solutions. Important to me. And that's why I, when the project was advertised for our club to get involved, I jumped on it because I just thought, dang, they're testing it. And I thought that was just really cool. And I wanted to be part of that. That's also why I was a, a volunteer to be a, a Christmas count compiler. I also am in charge of a little priority block for the, um, for the atlas, just uh, I like the science stuff. The kind of birding you wind up doing on this isn't like going out and seeing pretty birds and adding to your year list or uh, getting a new species. It's it's kind of sciencey. So I'll keep that in mind when I go through the protocol, and I'll come back to that a bit. So uh, I see this more as like service work rather than birding for fun. And that's where our Christmas counts ought to be too. I mean, we all go out and Christmas count to get a good bird today and see all that and have all that fun. But, you know, we did it right. We just go up and down the streets and cover the entire city and get an accurate picture of um, what actually is in the county state, not running all over on Christmas day, <laughs> looking for a cool bird. Anyway, I'm preaching there a little bit. <laughs> that's, the, that's the scientist. Okay, so uh, what did they do? They needed an army of volunteers. That's where we come into play. They took the entire country and broke it up into 10 kilometer square blocks. This is our region right here. Right smack dab in the middle is uh, Charlotte. This was assigned to us. Down in the lower left is Chester, South Carolina, Gastonia, Right, you pointing? Yeah. Yeah, and then upper left, Lincolnton, all the way up to near to Kannapolis, down the lower right to Wadesboro and Marshville, almost the PD, down to um, Waxhaw, and then back down to uh, Chester. So it's a very large region. There's about a hundred blocks here, and if you participate, sorry, squares, 
so 100 squares here. And if you participate, you get a square, and you're in charge of monitoring the birds at that particular uh, location. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's a Rorschach lodge. It's a, it's a chicken crossing a road. No. Um, the folks on Zoom actually see it. Hmm? The folks on Zoom okay. see it. So. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, that's the United States. These are participating chapters. So we're over here. Uh, right. Okay. Um, if you're a participating chapter, you're assigned target birds. And we've been given white-breasted and brown-headed nuthatch. In other regions of the country, eastern, western mountain bluebird, pygmy, red-breasted nuthatch might be assigned depending on your location. That means when you go out and plan where to sample, you try to pick habitat that would be good for nuthatches. If they gave us bluebird stew, we'd be in trouble because Bluebirds like open areas, nut hatches like trees. So they could have given us bluebirds, but you can't have both because you can't be two places at one time. As uh, far as red breasted nut hatches, they are here in the winter, but only during eruption years. So you report every bird you see. So they get red breasted nut hatch data anyway. And I, they can play with it if they want. But as far as choosing the site where you're going to look, you're thinking uh, white breasted and brown headed nuthatch. Um, why brown headed nuthatches? It's a great bird to pick to look at the impact of climate change. On this slide on the left, I have their range map in pink. And on the right, this is a composite map of um, forest types. Forest types are Pine, 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 upper right, oak hickory, cypress, juniper, and then non forest land. So, all of these colors involve piney areas, which uh, nut hatches do like, except the oak hickory, which is light blue. See Virginia and uh, Tennessee. And you notice over on the map, they're not in Virginia or Tennessee and a little bit in uh, East Texas, and they're not in East Texas either. So everywhere they are is where all the forest app types are with pine. If you look at oak hickory, light blue, they're not uh, there because they don't look at hickory type birds. Got that? Now, um, I'm probably oversimplifying this. But if you like pine trees and they're only in the southeast and the climate warms and you want to go north, you can run into the mountains, go over the mountains, there aren't any pine trees. So you're kind of stuck. Unless the birds can all of a sudden like warmer temperatures, I don't know where the pine trees are going to go. But this is implying that the birds are going to move north, the pine trees aren't going to go with them, and they'll get squeezed out, kind of like the birds on the mountaintops getting squeezed um, off the top of the mountains. When I think about putting up a brown headed nuthatch box, I think of it as buying time. Because as a biologist, I have a little bit of faith in the genetic variability stored in populations. Give them a few generations, maybe they'll be able to adapt. Maybe there's some alleles out there for genes that'll allow them to handle one adaptation. And they might surprise us. So every generation, every bird, we give a little help, we give them a little time, so maybe they can adjust. The whole problem with climate change is the temperature is changing so fast that we assume the populations can't keep up, can't evolve with them, and you know they just don't have the evolution is a slower process than the climate change we're forcing on them over just uh, a, a few decades. So, uh, this is the Climate Watch prediction for uh, brown headed nut hatches. Uh, the red is where they will lose their range, and there's a little bit of light blue around Nashville there where they may gain that. But they're predicting them to be extirpated from the area that's um, red, 100% of the range loss, it's got to be with a three degree warming scenario, but uh, 
things don't look good for uh, brown headed nut hatch. Let's say surprises. I don't like pine trees anymore. There's a bird out there. You know, maybe they can. Maybe they can. Uh, maybe they can hang in there. So that's obviously a bird assigned to us that makes a whole lot of sense. So we could look at it here in uh, Charlotte. What about white-breasted nut hatches? Uh, not necessarily restricted to pines. Birds of mature woods, more often found in deciduous than con coniferous forests, including woodland edges, open areas with large trees, parks, wooded sub suburbs, and yards. You might have them both in your backyard, but if you have brown-headed nut hatches, of course, they move around quite a bit during the day, at least for breeding or you know, pines nearby. Um, okay, you can see that. This is the uh, climate watch prediction for white breasted nut hatches. Again, disappearing where the red is, but gaining the light loop. And that light loop goes <laughs> all the way up to uh, near Alaska. On the lower left, I have their current distribution at first. Hmm? It actually, it actually goes in Alaska. On the lower left, in blue is their current range. See, they pretty much stop at the northern United States. But here they have them moving all the way up into. Uh, yeah. I think that's surprising because that's pine forest up there, taiga, I would assume. And uh, I don't, I, I just, not such a bleak scenario for white hat, not red, pressed night hatches because they're not restricted to the pines to the southeastern United States. Um, I think um, um, I think 2100 would say 50 to 80 years, 50 to 80 years. But still an interesting bird for us to be monitoring because we're in the red zone for a white rest of that axis. Um, why weren't we given bluebirds? You can't survey both habitats at one time. And also they seem to be stable for this area. So only a little bit of range loss on the Eastern edge and 92% uh, yellow, the range would be maintained. So that's why we're paying attention to brown headed and nut hatches and white breasted. Okay, the protocol for uh, climate watch surveys is you get a square. I assign that to you, you pick one. And uh, you find 12 locations within the square. Again, that's a 10 kilometer or six miles square block that have pine trees, good for nut hatches or mature trees. Each location has to be a minimum of 200 meters apart. You stop, you count all the birds for five minutes five minute point count, you pack in your car, if you pack in your bike, start walking, go to the next site and do that again. Five minute count, five minute count, five minute count, 12 sites times five minutes, it's an hour of counting plus transit time. Finish by 1230, uh, my sites I drive to, so it's no problem at all. I mean, I start around nine o'clock, I'm a late sleeper. and. Uh, I'm done by 11.30, pretty easy. Hour of counting, I just drive, 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 I'm done. A um, couple people walk, one family bikes, so it might take a little bit longer. Pretty easy, once you set up your site, twice a year, a winter sample, some day between January 15th and February 15th, you count one morning and then for the summer season, one day between May 15th and June 15th. You count that morning and you're done. <laughs> That's my route. Um, anybody who knows Allison Ferry is the only thing that shows up right there. Um, anyway, uh, since I run the show, I got to pick a good place. So, uh, I'm going to tell you anyway. This is you can use use your challenge to uh, think of uh, locations. 
This is uh, behind the old nature center at Lata Plantation, right by the equestrian center. I go down and up, this is the canoe launch. This is a uh, uh, Buzzard Rock parking lot at Lata Plantation. And this is down in the picnic area at Lata Plantation. You know those spots? Then you go out and you come up and come out Neck Road as I'm heading out to Countsport. I started Johnson Davis Road and Arthur Houghton Road. You know those? One, two, pick five spots there. I go over here to Allison Ferry and get one, then enter Countsport and do one side kind of in the middle and one almost at the platform. Not at the platform because I went trees just before that were the, uh, the gates. If you've never been in these places, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you have, you probably have an idea. So I pull in behind the old nature center about nine o'clock, get out of my car, five minutes, count every bird, you enter it in eBird. Then I get in the car and drive over to the canoe launch. You know, like I said, it's not exciting so much, but it's service. You're doing your part to help us get a handle on the future of these birds. I really think it is important. Hmm? Question. Yes. You said you entered the bird? Yes. Do you enter other birds that you hear? Yeah, you? every bird you hear or see. So it's like the uh, pretty bird. Story. Exactly. Yeah. So if somebody's with you, they wouldn't even know that. Brown-headed and uh, white-breasted nuthatches are target species. Other than they might say, "Why are we always at pine trees or something?" Like that. <laughs> you know, why didn't I stop at Roll Hill? You know, drive right through that. If I was doing bluebirds, I would do something else. So I'm, I'm making the point. You know, it takes a while to figure out where to go, but if you're familiar with your square and you get your sights, you just show up and do it twice a year, and you're you're done. Is it herd, herd birds too? Yeah. That's one of the reasons why they pick brown-headed and white-breasted nuthatches. Their calls are really pretty easy to identify, and they're also easy to identify by sight. So um, um, they're handy that way. Um, I'm going back to our territory again. Remember Chester to Gastonia and all the way around. Uh, all the colored sites have been sampled in the past. The red ones aren't being sampled now. The green ones are where we're sampling. And uh, you have to do a minimum of 10 squares. Right now we're doing 15. Although I only have 14 piloted there, I must have missed one. But so we're, we're okay right now. Um, but there's always room for more people to come on. Somebody could pick up those red ones we're not doing anymore. And I'd really like, I mean, notice we're all around Charlotte because people like to stay near their uh, uh, home turf. Boy, is anybody from Chester here today? <laughs> or Rock Hill or Gastonia or those places? It would be great if we could get some of those other uh, areas covered. So 15 sites being sampled, 85 not being sampled. If you want to help, you can pick up one of those other spots. Each square, I don't know if you can notice, notice how they're a little darker blue on the left, the square boundaries. So that's a color code that has to do with their uh, suitability for uh, nut hatches. So each, each square by the model is given uh, predictive nature. So how suitable they should be. And, you know, after you count your birds, it goes to the modelers and they do all their work to see if they're moving into the right squares or not. Okay. <laughs> Forget that one. <laughs> now that you know what we do, I thought I would uh, uh, tip my hat to everyone that's participated. So, uh, Natasha, Ron, uh, Jim, guidance here, right? Um, I haven't met some of these people, so we just do it Lilla's online. On, on, on. Hmm? Lilla's, Lilla's on here. It's right underneath you. Oh. Hi there. <laughs> no, you don't know. You went into the camera. Hi there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, there are many others here 
that I, I, I'm reluctant to name because I'll leave somebody out, but there are people that go along, like uh, Jan Fowler has had, I think her daughter go with her, and Chris Talkington, and um, Tom and Tammy go, Sanders, and the, the Howards are a whole family that goes, like I said, on bikes. Uh, Dennis Kent, I think has gone with Greg Hayes, maybe John Scavetta, I'm not sure. Um, so um, there are other people in addition. So I don't know, about 20 some people here and maybe another 20 people that have uh, participated. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll get to that at the end. It's mainly just contact me, and then, you know I'll, we'll talk about what kind of uh, squares are available where you live and uh, that kind of thing. So hats to, off to everybody that's uh, participating. I originally told these folks that it was a 25-year project. I don't know <laughs> where I got that. I was happy because I was only going to be 87 when it was over, <laughs> but. Uh, through a recent email, they said it's going on until they run out of money. So this is like, uh, yeah, <laughs> it depends. So uh, this is more or less like um, Christmas bird camps and stuff. It's a continuous program. So some of us are going to finish it. I mean, finish, uh, <laughs> leave the realm. Uh, we need more people to come along. So uh, there's got to be a rolling participation here, so. Okay, um, that's why it's done. We're monitoring birds to see if their movements match the predictions from the model because these scientists are going ahead and testing their predictions. And that's how you do it. Any questions about what Climate Watch is? Then, because that's pretty much that part done. Mm -hmm. Questions about if you say you get a square, are there you don't have you know a couple parts or something in that square? Um, you know, I'm thinking where I live, there's 12 acres behind me that have a great stand of tires that might not have a great stand of tires, but it's right. Uh, how are you? Selecting That's why I went to ladder plantation, counties board myself, and trying to pick areas that you think will be stable. Um, if development takes place, you're allowed to move your points. If you wind up with no more points left, maybe that's answering the question, <laughs> right? So uh, maybe you ought to just keep counting, and maybe through their GIS work, they'll they'll uh, uncover the fact that there's a reason why you just lost paper. So it not be, uh, the important thing that I keep reminding myself is zero is a really important uh, bird count, particularly in this project. So uh, I guess that would be that, but I, it's okay to move points. I have been told it's okay to move points if development takes place, but- Or you know, insects, I mean, that's a, hmm? or insects, I mean, that's yeah, right. Well, he, he was saying that just not necessarily through development, but just through uh, beetles and such, and people are removing pine trees because of uh, pests. So that might make a spot bad that was good. So you just do your best to pick good sites and Move them if you have to. Actually, Johnson Davis Road, if you know where that is, coming off of Neck Road, I had a great place with pine trees. I came back one season, they were all gone, and it's all quilled, gone. And that's the first time I heard uh, nut hatches, probably because I could hear better. I don't know, but I keep stopping there now. Um, one thing I think about is, you know, there I, often I, I go out, I've gone out and got zero or one or two after my whole morning, I come out and park my car and get out of my car and I hear a white-breasted nuthatch and a brown-headed nuthatch before I walk in the house. So um, I might just consider going up and down streets. If you've got an old neighborhood, you know, that'd probably be kind of stable, except for where I am, they're all teared out. Whatever. <laughs> okay. 
Um, well, anyway, um, th this last part is the scientists are starting to uh, test the data. Now, uh, look down at the bottom, this study, which is the only one I've found that has been produced so far, was published in 2020. It was written in 2019, and they used data from 2016 to 2018. The project started in 2016, in the summer. They didn't start nut hatches until the winter of 2017. So this is almost like one and a half years worth of data. So this is behind, not 1920, 21, and 22. So they're probably due for another uh, publication to come out. And they're mainly interested in here is, are the models working? They're not so much interested in what the birds are doing. So this may or may not even be relevant to, to us. So uh, I, I got this off online where there is a PowerPoint presentation and some of these images from the article that I just showed you. One thing they put it, are species moving into sites that are projected to be climate suitable by the model? So yes, 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 yes. This is Eastern Bluebird, Mountain Bluebird, Western Bluebird, Brown-Headed Nuthatch, Red-Breasted Nuthatch, Red-Breasted and Pygmy Nuthatch. The only ones that aren't yeses say more data needed. And obviously there's more data needed because they only have a year's worth of data here that they're uh, compiling. But the yeses are enough to get the modelers excited. <laughs> if you can excite a um, they put in some graphs like this. Here they're looking at when a square gets the bird for the first time. Is that bird coming up in a square that would be climatically suitable? So a good point would be on the upper right. On the upper right, the probability of a, it, it, there's a high probability that a new occupant is in a climate suitable square. If you had a point down in the lower right, that would mean that the birds that are turning up, I knew I would struggle with this, that, that the, the probability of a new occupant is very low down the y-axis in climatically suitable sites. So you want to have a graph going down from the lower left up to the upper right. A lower left number would be there's a very low probability of a new bird turning up according to what's being reported in less climatically suitable sites. So you want an upward slope. That would be good news. A downward slope would be exactly opposite what they predicted. So they produce these graphs and they're kind of going up. So uh, it, they're looks like the model is working. So this is the same graph for uh, Eastern blue haired bird, brown headed nuthatch. Red breasted nuthatch, <laughs> white breasted nuthatch, top row is the summer and the bottom row is the uh, winter. Not completely exciting, but <laughs> enough to get the, uh, have some positive reinforcement. Um, this is an opposite question. Are birds disappearing from sites that are climatically suitable? That'd be a surprise. Or from sites that are climatically unsuitable. So upper left, it's very likely that the birds that are extinct, extinction or leaving a site are leaving sites that are less climatically suitable. And it's a very low probability down the y-axis that birds are leaving sites that are climatically suitable. So it's really the same question. It's not about birds that are arriving in new squares, about birds that are disappear disappearing from old squares. This time you want the graph to go down like that. And it's working for these two. I've only picked these two birds because that's the only two that they reported on. I can't have a graph for other species. Okay, this is another public graph that they put out. I think this will work. I might have to leave to point down at the lower left. 
I have the um, range of the brown headed nut hatch now. And remember earlier, they're going to get wiped out completely from the southeast. The color code here is lower occupancy in red. So they are leaving the southeastern United States. And the lighter blue is higher occupancy. And believe it or not, it looks like they're crossing the uh, mountains and yeah. they were pretty much going to get wiped out totally. But I mean, I don't have the details, but the graph looks like they're saying that they are moving into, uh, I don't know if you go far to say it was Ohio. They're just moving, moving a little bit over the mountains. So maybe the birds are surprising us a little bit. That's just me looking at the graph. I don't. I may be missing something there. Over here, it's uh, winter for uh, white breasted nuthatches. And they're losing ground in the northeast. But look, remember, oh, there's the graph again of their current distribution. About limited uh, to the northern United States. Remember earlier I said they might go all the way up to uh, uh, Alaska. And looks like they're uh, they're doing it. So just looking at those two graphs, rather than the you know the, the line plots, these um, two maps, it seems to be as though to me that the birds are performing like they predicted. Hmm? It really, Sharon said that her dad reported that he saw two brown headed nuthatches in Mich Michigan this uh, summer. Uh, <laughs> people that get around a lot, uh, could you comment on seeing brown headed or people from other relocated folks? Um, well, I know that folks up in the mountains have been. Only about ten years ago, the first brown-headed nuthatch was reported that up in the mountains in North Carolina, and now at the lower elevations, they're very common. Okay. So, um, so I mean, enough information to say that after one and a year's half a year's worth of data, it looks like the models are performing okay. I don't know if that's exciting news or not, because <laughs> the backstory is the birds are moving, and that's tough on the birds. And it could be, you know, don't get excited because they're moving. Uh, you're predicting. We'd rather have them to stay put. That's what would be exciting, I guess. Yeah. I'm sure they are. This are, he's asking whether they're looking at abundance as well as just uh, presence and absence. So I'm sure they are, but I, I haven't seen anything. But that data certainly is there because you do report uh, abundance. Okay, um, that's my uh, end. We talked about what the program is, some of the initial findings something that our club is doing you may not have known about. <clears throat> if you want to participate, um, you can contact me. It's just Ken Nidal at gmail.com. So it's an easy uh, uh, email. Um, I guess there's a few squares tucked around in Charlotte. We might get more people would have a, the absolute center of our territory covered. But if you're willing to do some of the peripheral areas, that would be a that would be uh, great to make our uh, data collection a little bit more safe. Okay, I think I'm done. More questions or? Good. So if we did elect to pick up a square, did we choose our location or is there some guidance? Um, you can take, uh, uh, the, the question is, 
how do you, as a new participant, choose your particular location? So that just amounts to scouting. Um, there's an online program which varies in its behavior, but where you can choose your points, put them in, and the program will run and put a circle around it of 200 meters to see if they don't overlap. Otherwise, you just have to trust yourself with your car odometer or whatever that you've gone far enough to get 200 meters apart. But it's just a matter of scouting um, and looking for pine trees, Virginia pine and shortleaf pine, maybe more than loblolly, because I don't think there should be loblollies in Macabre County. So, uh, you know, just look around and um, make sure they're 200 meters apart. And you can get the whole thing covered. Like I say, it's best to drive from one spot to another, but people have pulled it off on bikes. And well, uh, Dennis can't walk, but he does. He, sorry, he, he does uh, Colonel Beatty, and he just walks around the uh, perimeter. So it's got a big square, but all the spots are you know right around the lake, which is okay. They're 200 meters apart. Instead of going, you know, if you're doing that, then you, you likely need to drive. How, how do you do yours, Jim? Do you, walk. you walk it. Yeah. But how long does it take you? Jim's guidance so back. Well, So Jim, Jim is saying it's fun, <laughs> and he walks it. I mean, you got to be into that kind of birding, you know, because it's just. Hmm? Right. Like, you yeah, only at your spot. Natasha, do you drive or walk? Yeah. Uh, I asked Natasha whether she drove. She says she does a combination of both. Jim Guyton walks his and can barely squeeze it in. I can see that. Uh, but, um, Early start. You can go to whatever. Good. Like how when we're birding now, if you want to, you don't have to bird like the North Carolina birding hours. And how do they, is there a drop down for the climate watchers? How do the people that are compiling know those are for that? You just create a regular, the question is how do you submit the data through eBird? You just do a regular eBird checklist, just a five minute list. That's all you mark whether you, there are feeders or, um, nest boxes in the area in the comments section. But every eBird checklist has a, a identification number at the top. So uh, you go to the Climate Watch website and there's a portal there. You just enter your name and the name of Mecklenburg Audubon and they have uh, 10 spots where you cut and paste the um, ID number from your eBird list and then you submit it. So you don't do it directly from eBird, you lift the, uh, yeah, you lift the ID of the, the, of the uh, checklist into the uh, portal. It takes, just takes a few minutes. Okay, let's hope those birds um, manage this. I still pulling for genetic variability. Mm -hmm. The question is, 
do the models take into account change in the abundance of food sources for the birds years down the road? And I'm certain that they do. That's just part of their modeling. So they're not only modeling the movement of the birds, they're monitoring the mo movement of their habitat and the, the component species within it, which sounds like, what? You know, how could you possibly do that? But, um, that's definitely part of it. Because birds can fly, but trees, for them to move north, one seed's got to go that far, and it takes generations for forests to move north. Birds are ready to go and fly, but you know the weather might be driving them north, but there's a lag between the plants and the insects that are associated with those plants to uh, move as well. So all that's part of what needs to be modeled. If they didn't take that into account, I think the models would be junk. Yeah, that's why the habitat loss um, development. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, he's saying that um, people's backyard birding can allow birds to colonize new sites. I'm trying to remember back when I was teaching, I think one of the class examples was the black cap. Is there a black cap? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the black caps are like the center of their range was in Germany. And in winter, they normally went to Spain. But there's this another population that went to England and where they're surviving at feeders. And now the two populations, since the birds that go to England fly a shorter distance, I think their wing lengths are changing. So there, you know, there's changes in their uh, uh, computer population that come back, they're not breeding with each other. So it's it's speciation taking place just because of the backyard bird uh, feeding that allows that group to uh, move north. I think I got that right. I'm going back 10 or 12 years to something I, hmm? Okay, the combination of being warmer in Britain plus the backyard bird feeding. That's allowed actually, a population to split off from what normally would be only a winter population in Spain. That's actually has occurred with the dark eyed junco out on the west coast. They started staying all year. They would go from the mountains down to the coast in the winter. Well, they seem to like the campus, UNC campus, and they're now staying there all year and their wings started to get a little bit smaller because they're not moving and there's some changes. So they're getting some speciation in there as well. Uh, really kind of thing. I think Santa Barbara also has, has a, a group and they actually found another uh, another set in Illinois at a campus. But it's all campus. It's campus. So Judy just offered another example in California. Back to your question. Did the modelers predict that backyard bird Feeding would allow that to produce that split. I doubt it. So that'd probably be a surprise. And uh, I'm thinking back now to those brown headed nut hatches that are moving a little bit north. Well, I'd like to know what's going on there. But maybe that's backyard bird feeding or something like that. It's totally a surprise, but um, uh, that's just a wild guess. But I guess that's kind of what you're getting at. But that was such a peculiar thing. Who would have predicted that? And, that's an iconic class of skeptic. Yeah. All right, so um, proving the model, birds are shifting. 
So what? What's the end game? What's what's the point? Well, we're back to three hundred. So the question is, I think, um, what's the end game? What's the ultimate outcome here? And I'm back to three hundred eighty-six bird species threatened to go to extinction. Uh, you can, uh, I mean, broaden that question to uh, the mass extinction we're in right now and other modeling saying we're going to lose half the world's species. Um, it's like uh, less 3 billion insect species since 1970 and 70% of the, I'm, I'm pulling these numbers out yeah. of insect so species. Point, is, this prompting any action by is it prompting action? Mm -hmm. Any conservation um, The ultimate thing for Audubon is saying, hey, our models are working. The birds are moving there. You better preserve that habitat. Like I know like the Nature Conservancy has changed their focus from preserving the habitats we see now. They're guessing where the wetlands are going to be 10, 20, 30 right. years down the road, and they're starting to preserve areas that they're guessing will be more important in the future. So um, it's a combination of that. Um, so, um, so are we running up the white flag and saying this process is happening and about trying to get at the root cause? Well, the root cause, I can't remember if you started by saying you're climate skeptic or not, but you know, the root cause, as far as I'm concerned in the scientific community is, is, is fossil fuel emissions. So the action there would be to limit that. If you can, uh, I, I, um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not a real optimist. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but you know, you, I, you read all the books, Mike, Michael, uh, when you read all the books and they always end with a few chapters, all oh, we need to do this and everything's going to be fine. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not a climate change skeptic at all. It's just, I, I would hope that the ultimate okay. goal would be to prompt people to say, yes, this is another piece of evidence that yeah. this is happening. Let's fix it. Because we don't want them to do it. Like, we want them to stay here. So what do we do? Okay, if, if the question is asking me personally whether this will trigger action to, uh, say not only birds but insects and other wildlife as well um i think we're headed for a mass extinction i mean everybody predicts to 2100 what about 2200 2300 2400 2500 what about a thousand years from now so uh, uh yeah i think um we're headed to a world of Maybe half as many species. I, I hate to pick the number half, but uh, well, that's quite a bit. And I, the other thing that you might be looking at is uh, so much of what we hear, climate change related, is starting to change, but so much of what we hear is modeling. And so everyone wants to argue is your model is right? What did you put into it? How did it come together? This is the proof. We need to, the last sentence was going to be, the models tell us what sh should happen. Climate Watch tells you, gives you the answer whether it is or not. So that's, you can't, you got to have the answer to have any faith in the modeling. So that's, I think what you're saying is what this is special is they are going forward and actually following through with the tests. So I wish I could be more optimistic and hate to end on a downer, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, we need to face that. Yeah. We need to face that. I am an ecologist, by the way. I've got a PhD in ecology. So don't, not... just don't forget to vote. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. You can do that. Okay. <laughs>
There's some free books over there that I brought in. If you didn't look at those, you could watch them. Yes, Ken is offering up some of his beloved books over here. So you Not can, related to the program. Just you can take them if you want. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. We still have some uh, snacks left. So if you'd like a little more to drink or to eat, our next membership meeting is going to be December 1st. And it will be Matthew Withrow, and he did a big year for North Carolina last year, and I think he set the record for North Carolina big years. I don't know if he still holds it or not, but I guess not because this year's not over yet. <laughs> he'll still he'll give us a story of why he still holds the record. <laughs> Hope to see you all here on December 1st. Thanks for coming out.